So welcome to all uh, in this new webinar on the legal aspects of lethal autonomous weapon system. My name is Pauline Warnot and I'm a researcher within the security and technology program at UNIGER. And it's my great pleasure today to open the last part of this series of three webinars that um, we are jointly organized with UNIGER and UNODA in the framework of the discussion taking place in the group of governmental experts on the emerging technologies uh, in the area of lethal autonomous weapon DG on those. After the technological aspects webinar that took place on Monday and the military aspects webinar that took place on Tuesday, our discussions today will focus on the legal aspects of lethal autonomous weapon systems. After years of discussions in the DG on loads, there are areas of conversion, notably regarding the applicability of IHL to new weapon systems, including emerging technologies in the area of those. There are also areas of clear divergence, notably regarding uh, the sufficiency of the extent IHL to deal with such technology. There is also, and above all, um, a need and a will to seek further clarity on numerous areas related to these new weapons, especially in light of the mandate of the GG on laws for 2020 and 2021, to produce consensus recommendation in relation to the clarification, consideration, and development of aspects of the normative and operational framework on emerging technologies in the area of lethal autonomous weapons. Approaching the substance of the legal aspects from in the core of this normative and operational um, framework will be the ambition of today's webinar. For moderating with me today's discussions, I'm very happy to welcome Ms. Pia Devoto. Director of the Argentinian Organization uh, Association for Public Policy, APP, and notably a founding member and coordinator of the Latin American and Caribbean Human Security Network, CELA. With her and with our panelists, we will be approaching from a concrete and practical angle five of the main topics related to the legal aspects of lethal autonomous weapons systems, the human element or human control, the notion of ethics and the Merton's clause, the practical implementation of IHL during the conduct of hostility, the question of responsibility and accountability, and naturally the central question of the debate, how to regulate the dehumanization of warfare. To answer those questions, I'm very pleased and privileged to announce that we could gather today a few of the fine speakers and specialists on let me thank for their presence our speakers. In order of appearance, Professor Bakhtiar Tuzmukamedov, Ms. Neta Gustak, Dr. Thompson Chengeta, Professor Ray Nivoja, and Professor Leng Sinyu. Their respective achievements and quality would be too long to enumerate here, and I invite you to check the biography that have been uploaded on our website. As for the technological and military webinar, you will be given the opportunity to ask questions directly to our experts using the chat box. Experts will also answer the questions that have been sent in advance by registered participants, and we thank you again for your involvement in moving forward this fascinating discussion. Without further delay, I'm very pleased to give the floor to Professor Bakhtiar Tuzmukamedov, International Law Professor and Vice President of the Russian International Law Organization. Association, who may do us the great pleasure of rearranging his schedule to be with us today and help us to answer the question how to regulate the dehumanization of warfare. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, at the outset, let me uh, thank uh, the hosts uh, and uh, Pauline uh, or not uh, in particular for the invitation to join the event. Uh, uh, it is also good to re-engage uh, with the UNIDIR uh, after more than more than a quarter of a century. I regret that the uh, invitation arrived when I was uh, already bound by other commitments, hence my early departure from this meeting for which I apologize in advance. And actually, Pauline, you relieved me of the need to speak at all because in your introductory uh, statement, you uh, really touched bases, uh, most bases that I wanted to uh, discuss uh, to verify connectivity, cyber connectivity. I uh, listened briefly to yesterday's deliberations, uh, which prompted me to start with um, a couple of observations. Um, firstly, it was stated that the Martin's clause somehow 
applied to lethal autonomous uh, weapon system, and you made a quick reference to Martin's clause yourself. Uh, I believe that um, the clause had first been mentioned uh, as being relevant to laws within the context of the uh, group of governmental experts meeting in August uh, 2018. Without going into the negotiating history of uh, convention with respect to the laws and customs of uh, war on land, I, everyone would recall that uh, the clause first appeared in the in the preamble to that uh, convention. Uh, it was a diplomatic stratagem. It was a ploy, legal diplomatic, which was suggested by Further Martins as a means to remove stumbling blocks and open the way to conclusion of the convention. Um, in and of itself, the Martin's Clause does not bear any normative content. It is a call to negotiation of specific uh, regulations, whether limits, uh, restrictions, reductions, or bans. And indeed, uh, the Martin's Clause served in that capacity, whether with respect to that very convention of 1899 or to the Geneva Protocol of 1925, or ultimately, the Chemical Weapons Convention. Speaking of chemical weapons, while chemical weapons had been alien to, and using the language of Martin Squaws, requirements of human conscience for quite a while, the Martin's Clause had to be translated into specific, predictable, comprehensive, and comprehensible provisions of a treaty. Secondly, and uh, Vadim Kazulin, uh, who spoke yesterday, should correct me if I got him wrong, but he seemed to have suggested that a term non-lethal autonomous weapons embraces, embracing uh, items like plastic bullets, adhesive substances, um, chemical irritants, and other riot control um, means uh, that may have uh, tactical usages as well. So these items were embraced by that newly invented term. With all due respect to Vadim, to my compatriot, by the same token, any object with a weapon capability or with a capability to harm a human other than blade and a club, unless thrown at a target, could count as an autonomous weapon, which means that humanity has deployed such weapons ever since a prehistoric hunter picked up a stone and uh, launched it at a saber-toothed tiger. This, in turn, prompts me to uh, raise two interrelated issues, the definition of laws and uh, uh, modalities of their regulation. How do you define automatization versus autonomization and then draw a clear demarcation line between the two? I, I dare to assume that these terms are defined in different ways in uh, uh, national uh, technical and uh, scientific glossaries. I encountered that problem uh, while exploring differences um, in um, uh, terminology in Russian and English arms control treaties, uh, focusing in particular on the arms control on the ABM treaty. As one negotiator told me, and I was talking to negotiators on both sides, uh, so as one of them told me, some provisions of the ADM treaty, in particular with respect to the meaning of the term development, development of a system, development of a component of a system, reflected parties, and I quote, agreement to disagree. As applied to laws, the question of terminology boils down to identification of the threshold of complete dehumanization of a decision on life deprivation. As um, human uh, influence on a machine becomes more remote and tending towards negligible value or zero, several questions arise, some more technical, more legalistic than others, including but not legal, limited to the following. How to ensure the system's capability not to launch an attack or to instantly abort the mission if something goes wrong? Is it feasible to equip a system with permissive action links? How to ensure that a duly authorized and responsible human operator can effectively take the steering wheel at any time? Here we may be reminded of an episode from Cold War when in 1983, 
the Soviet early warning systems detected what looked like incoming ballistic missiles even prior to their separation from from the so-called bus when when uh, uh, the warheads uh, spread. Twelve minutes before anticipated impact, the launch on warning sequence was discontinued by a duty officer at the command and control center. He reasoned that he had too few blips on his radar screen to identify a massive attack and the host hostile nature of the incoming objects that were registered by the radar was not being confirmed by um, other technical means. A human discontinued what appeared to be an almost automatic launch sequence. As if we approach uh, the issue of dehumanization from the point of view of international humanitarian law, then one of the apparent questions would be how to ensure compliance of laws with fundamental principles of proportionality, distinction, and um, necessity. In particular, how to uh, ensure a system's compliance with uh, these principles uh, in a uh, rapidly developing combat environment rich with emerging targets of opportunity. How to ensure a system's ability to disengage upon completion of a mission. How to guarantee its protection from uh, acquisition of control over it by uh, unauthorized entities, whether human or not, whether evil or, 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 or innocent. Um, how to deploy the system in a mode that takes constant care to spare all that is civilian. Furthermore, uh, there is an issue of proliferation or, uh, or dispersion and ultimately erosion of individual criminal responsibility for wrongful acts. Or consider another IHL dimension, um, which human in the loop should, shall be a legitimate target for a retaliatory strike in operations involving such systems. If there is no immediate operator, would it then be a designer or a manufacturer who put together a weapon, a programmer who developed a software? If, if you look uh, at currently deployed systems, in particular hunter-killer uh, UAVs, uh, then in my opinion, uh, and it's not only my opinion, uh, a crew operating such vehicle from an air base in Nevada, uh, could become a legitimate target, even if the vehicle they operate loiters in the airspace over, uh, let me use the words from an old song, faraway places with strange sounding names. Um, let me identify another legal uh, dimension of the use of laws uh, in anger. Uh, they may be deployed in circumstances of an international armed conflict, a non-international armed conflict, or outside of both. Uh, to illustrate the latter, let me remind you of attacks on Anwar al in 2011 and um, Qasem Soleimani earlier this year. al was a US citizen killed in Yemen without due legal process because of his alleged contribution to an armed conflict in Afghanistan by a missile launched from a US government owned and operated um, UAV that took off from Djibouti. So at least geographically we have US, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Djibouti. Soleimani was a senior Iranian official killed by an airstrike uh, launched from a US government owned and operated uh, UAV in Iraq outside of any armed conflict involving the United States um, and or Iran without notification of Iraqi uh, authorities about operations or foreign government um, aircraft uh, in their airspace. These two episodes demonstrate a conundrum of legal issues, a tight tangle of public international law, IHL, international human rights law, and if that's not enough, uh, domestic constitutional law. Uh, these two real life episodes may prompt me to refer you uh, to yet another aspects of uh, dehumanization, or rather the need to keep a human in the decision-making loop. You, you may have watched uh, the movie uh, Eye in the Sky uh, released in 2015. 
if you have, and, I, and uh, uh, Pauline is smiling, she has, um, then um, you would recall that in the background of evolving tactical and political situation leading to a decision to release a weapon, there was a continuous flow of legal advice. A good friend of mine uh, who operated in a very similar environment confirmed that he had a legal team that assisted in decision making and in providing advice um, to national political leadership with whom the ultimate decision to release a weapon uh, rests. Before I conclude, um, let me briefly address um, the matter of prospective regulation of laws, uh, including proposals to conclude yet another protocol to the CCV, CCW, I'm sorry. Apparently, means and methods already regulated by the convention are defined with reasonable detail. We know what are incendiary weapons for the purposes of Protocol 3. We know what are uh, explosive remnants of war for the purposes of Protocol 5. Protocols impose restrictions or prohibitions based on available and proven knowledge, um, particular uh, of, of those systems as well as of particular modes uh, of, um, of their use until and unless we obtain a similar and shared knowledge about laws that could be translated into treaty language, it is doubtful that uh, the matter may be ripe for official negotiation of legally binding texts. Otherwise, we may face uh, the risk of having uh, a document that reflects, remind you, an agreement to disagree. Uh, the CCW uh, ought not be burdened with a stillborn protocol. However, at the current stage, uh, it may be worth considering arrangements uh, other than legally binding, uh, whether they're called guidelines or uh, guiding principles. They could contain initial, initial common understandings of systems and their components and methods of their use uh, and initial understandings uh, so reached uh, could then be developed further uh, as knowledge about uh, systems and their handling is gained um, and um, enriched. Uh, it might also uh, be worth considering non-proliferation and export control initiatives, in, including end user certificates, uh, similar to MTCR and um, the uh, Wassenaar arrangement. And um, I hope I uh, did not uh, tread on grounds that will be covered by other panelists. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Professor, for this very comprehensive presentation that encompasses all the aspects that are of interest for those discussions on, on this autonomous weapon system. And I, I had a quick follow up question uh, for you and for your consideration because of you approach uh, those aspects from a very, com in a com very comprehensive manner. But would you say, and would you go as far to say that this is one of the first time um, in, in the, the law of war and the regulation of warfare that we are facing an issue where the actual legal framework might not be sufficient, but we don't know. This is not a political, as you said, this is maybe not a political um, problematic here that we are covering, but this is a problem of definition. We don't know what we are speaking about. We cannot know how to define some terms, and as long as we cannot define some terms and we don't understand how they work, then we cannot regulate them. And is then, therefore, all the legal framework that you, you, you mentioned, the IHL, but also the problem linked to, um, to, to export control measure and, and to uh, end user, um, user document, is it, would it be sufficient to deal with this technology should it be developed uh, in the near future, including the notion of, of human control that are speaking about during the discussions now, and the notion of accountability responsibility that is currently also discussed and currently dealt with regarding other weapons. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, firstly, I, I, I do believe that we have an issue of uh, 
terminology, which is not just uh, technical. Um, um, I, I, I refer to my experience with uh, the study of uh, the ABM treaty. Uh, while I was doing this, I looked into uh, the um, uh, respective uh, reference books uh, in the former Soviet Union and in the United States, which uh, defined uh, technologies that were applicable uh, in the uh, in the uh, anti-ballistic missile systems. And like I said, uh, the term ter terms described similar events in a different way uh, or similar events were described by the usage of very different terms. You would recall that occasionally uh, being unable to arrive at a certain conclusion, and this is not uh, about the, the, the terminology, and this is not characteristic of the ABM treaty only, uh, the negotiators would use a very vague term, for example, not research and development or development, but rather creation of a system. Creation, um, well, the world was created or something was created, but creation is not the right term to apply to a very material, very palpable uh, thing, including as, complica as compl uh, compl complex a system as as laws. So first, I need that we. Uh, I think that we need to, if not harmonize the terms, but at least arrive uh, at uh, at uh, at what we are dealing with: common understandings and common knowledge. Now, secondly, I think that there is no uh, unanimity amongst uh, the um, uh, technology experts uh, about uh, about what we're talking about, what systems are being addressed. Uh, Looking at the military um, again, uh, I, there is a difference uh, between opinions of uh, uh, people who would be sitting in uh, in uh, in the bunkers and the stuff, um, uh, as opposed to the opinion of tactical commanders in the field. A tactical commander in the field seems to be willing to have a system which is proven, which he or she knows how to use and what to expect of the system. I'm being uh, reminded of an episode um, of which I was told by one of the designers and manufacturers of uh, such a system. Well, it was a remotely, remotely piloted system when in the field, uh, the, uh, the, the combat troops tried to arm the system, which was originally designed for a mine sweeping purpose. And um, they mounted a standard submachine gun on that platform. And when I asked the question of, of, of a military, how did the system be, be, be behave itself? He said, well, the operator had enough time to take cover. So um, we need to, to, to take into consideration a host of these problems. When I was referring to the ABM treaty, remember, we were talking about a bilateral treaty. And uh, while it was extremely difficult, but still more possible, more feasible to arrive at a conclusion for two delegations, even despite controversies within uh, the delegations themselves, when military sometimes could not find common language with diplomats on their own side of the table. Now here, with respect to CCW, the protocol or laws, we have to accommodate the views of multiple actors, which too complicates. Uh, the whole thing. I um, I do not think that an overall uh, ban is feasible. Although I can see uh, multiple difficulties and obstacles in very specific item by item regulation restriction uh, reduction or ban. Thank you. Thank you very much, for Professor, for your time, and I know that it was very precious. So thank you again for being with uh, with us uh, today. Um, I will not pass the floor to uh, Miss uh, Pia Maria um, Devoto, who will be moderating uh, this event and who will launch the um, second panel. Thank you very much again. Thank you, and again, like I said, it's nice to re-engage with the Unidare after 25 years or more. Thank you. Well, point well taken. Thank you, Professor. I'm Maria Tedevoto. I'm going to be the moderator for the, this second panel, and it is a pleasure to have to present these uh, people. 
uh, uh, by the end of the of the um, presentations, you can use the Q and A function, as it was previously explained by Pauline. And the aim of this panel is to discuss the very notion and concept at the stakes versus the practical implication that will be discussed during the second part of the meeting, including the central notion of human control and the difficulties of discussing the practical implications of concepts such uh, as human control and ethics in this uh, kind of weapon. Uh, the idea is taking into account uh, past discussions during the GGE, guiding principles, the mandate, issues like interpretation of application of international humanitarian law. Uh, so just uh, I don't want like just to expand uh, to more. I want to present uh, the third speaker that is uh, Neta Gusak, that uh, she's uh, an associate senior researcher within CIPRIS armament and disarmament areas and special counsel with Lakebridge. Neta has worked as an international lawyer for over a decade, including for the International Committee of the Red Cross and the Australian Government's Office of International Law and as a lecturer at the Australian National University. Neda has particular expertise in legal frameworks related to the development, acquisition, and transfer of weapons. Neda has provided legal and policy advice related to new technology of warfare, including autonomous weapons, military applications of artificial intelligence, and cyber and space security. Since 2017, Neda has participated in the UN group uh, GGE on legal autonomous weapon systems. And together with Vincent Boulain, Maud Patrick Carson, and Neil Davidson, she is the author of the 2020 report, Limits on the Autonomy in Weapons Systems, Identifying Practical Elements of Human Control. So, Neta, her presentation is the legal basis of the human control and autonomous weapons systems. Neta, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Pia and Pauline. Thank you to Professor Tuzma um, for the remarks so far. And I'm also looking forward to hearing from um, Thompson Chengeta, from Ryan Levoya, and from Ji Yu. Um, I'm very pleased to be joining this uh, webinar and I'm very thankful for the invitation. Some of you may have already heard me uh, yesterday in the military aspects webinar, um, and I will definitely not be repeating myself. I mentioned yesterday how grateful I am for the opportunity to continue to support the work of the GGE in my new role at CIPRI, and what I neglected to mention and I'll mention to you is that I'm particularly pleased to do that in this webinar on my preferred topic, uh, the legal aspects. Um, today I'm going to be drawing on research that um, was conducted by both CIPRI and the International Committee of the Red Cross last year, uh, and which was published in a report uh, in June this year, um, the report that Pia just mentioned then. I'll put a link in the chat again in case you would like to access the report. And I want to basically address three key points. Firstly, I want to talk about the questions or challenges that arise um, in applying IHL in view of the unique characteristics of weapons that have autonomy uh, or that are able to select and apply force to targets autonomously without human intervention. I'd also like to describe the two school, two broad schools of thought that um, we, the researchers, um, discovered about how these kinds of challenges might be overcome when using autonomous weapon systems. And then I'd like to, to, to link that discussion to the discussion of the human element at the GGE. So firstly, the application of IHL. Now, we all know that autonomous weapons are not expressly regulated um, by IHL treaties, but thankfully in the CCW forum, it's undisputed that um, autonomous weapon systems must be capable of being used and must be used in accordance with existing rules of IHL, um, whether it's under treaty law or customary international law. Um, and in particular, the particularly relevant rules are the IHL rules on the conduct of hostilities, the principles and rules of distinction, proportionality and precautions in attack. Um, and to be clear, it's the user or the commander that's using an autonomous weapon system who is responsible for complying with the law, not the weapon itself. These rules, uh, the rules on the conduct of hostilities are applied by addressed to those who plan and decide on attacks. 
So this means that already we know some things about um, how autonomous weapon systems may or may not be used. The use of autonomous weapon systems that are by their nature indiscriminate is prohibited. The use of autonomous weapon systems to direct attacks against civilians and civilian objects is prohibited. Indiscriminate attacks using autonomous weapons are prohibited. Disproportionate attacks using autonomous weapons are prohibited. And during military operations, when using autonomous weapons, constant care must be taken to spare the civilian population and civilian objects. And everything feasible must be done to verify that the targets are military objectives and all feasible precautions must be taken, including in the choice of means and method of war warfare, that is in the choice of weapon, to avoid or at least minimize incidental civilian harm when carrying out attacks using autonomous weapon systems. These are the basic rules of IHR. Now, the unique characteristics of autonomous weapon systems can make the application of these rules challenging for the user. And by unique characteristics, what I mean is that some of the decisions and judgments required for compliance with these rules are made longer in advance of an application of force than is possible when using other non-autonomous types of weapons. And also that the user, the commander, doesn't know the exact target nor the exact timing, nor the exact location or circumstances of the application of force. This is what is unique about autonomous weapon systems as compared to other weapons. Now, today in the time available, we don't have time to comprehensively examine all of the questions of interpretation and application that arise when applying IHL uh, to the use of autonomous weapon systems in armed conflict. But I should say, this is the topic of a forthcoming CIPRI report, um, which will be available early next year. Today, though, what I did want to highlight are the th are three broad challenges that CIPRI and the ICRC identified when it comes to applying IHR. These are the three broad challenges, what we call a numbers challenge, a context challenge, and a predictability challenge. So very briefly, the numbers challenge means, by that we mean that when using an autonomous weapon system, key question is whether the commander is able to make the kinds of evaluative judgments required by IHL and whether this stands in contrast to the way in which autonomous weapons operate, which is based on pre-programmed target profiles and data that's collected through sensors. So when I talk about evaluative judgments, I think we can look at the principle of proportionality as an example. This principle says that incidental civilian harm, whether it's loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, expected from the attack um, cannot exceed the anticipated military advantage. Now, none of these concepts, whether it's incidental civilian harm or anticipated military advantage, are easily quantifiable, they are evaluative. And as I said, this stands in contrast to the way in which autonomous weapons operate. The second challenge I mentioned is the context challenge. So here, what we're referring to is the fact that under IHL, users have to make, users of weapons have to make context-based decisions in light of the circumstances ruling at the time of an attack. When making an ex ante or when making um, judgments in advance of an attack, users must have um, or must foresee um, the circumstances that will be present during the attack. Now, existing autonomous weapon systems are designed with limitations on the objects against which they can apply force and under what circumstances. And these programming decisions are made in advance of the commencement of an attack, but Compliance with IHL rules requires consideration of factors that may vary over time, not only between when an autonomous weapon system is programmed and then activated, but also between the point of activation and when force is eventually applied against a target. And this variability in time can affect the user's ability to make these kinds of 
um, foresights or predictions about the circumstances that will reign at the time of the application of force, which might mean that planning assumptions that existed at the point in which an autonomous weapon system is activated are not valid throughout the entire period of operation. Finally, the predictability challenge. Now, we know that commanders rely on the predictability of weapons and their environment of use in order to anticipate and to limit the effects of those weapons as required by IHL. And so predictability is, is really central to ensuring that the use of a weapon complies with IHL, including the rule on, rules on distinction. Now, the longer a weapon operates autonomously, the larger its geographic or spatial range, um, the more dynamic or unpredictable the environment of use, and the more difficult it will be for a user to reliably predict the effects of the weapon system in its environment of use and to rely on the pre-programmed target profile and the limitations that are programmed into the weapon system in order to comply with the rules. So those are the three key challenges that we identified, the numbers challenge, the context challenge, and the predictability challenge. But what's the consequences of having these challenges? And here, as I mentioned, we identified two broad schools of thought amongst the experts um, with whom we consulted um, on whether and how these challenges can be overcome when using autonomous weapon systems. Now, the two key schools of thought are people who um, adopt a technology-oriented approach, um, who would argue, for example, that autonomous weapon systems could one day be designed and programmed in ways that overcome these challenges. Um, that is, that the only limit uh, is to autonomy is the, the complexity or um, the design of the technology, that the more sophisticated or complex the weapon, the more tasks it can be assigned and the less direct or human control will be required during an attack. That is, you know, you, you select an autonomous weapon system to use in an attack and all that is required in order to comply with IHL is to take all feasible precautions um, during the attack uh, and nothing more. So that's one school of thought. The other school of thought is that these kinds of challenges, the numbers challenge, the context challenge, the predictability challenge, that they're actually indicators of what we, we called the limits of autonomy that would be permissible under IHL. So by this, this school of thought contends that no matter the technical characteristics of the autonomous weapon systems, IHL rules on the conduct of hostilities themselves demand some kind of contextual value-based judgments by the people who plan, decide on, and carry out attacks. And in order to compensate for the unpredictability that's introduced when using an autonomous weapon system, those people need to apply some kind of measure, otherwise they might be at risk of um, not complying with the rules of IHL. So what does this mean, these two school, broad schools of thought? And are they incompatible? Well, our view is that no, these two schools of thought are not incompatible. Um, and indeed, the two approaches to the application of IHL can, in fact, have something in common. That is, no matter what view you take, all experts um, would agree that some kind of measures are needed and should be taken by a user in relation to an attack that uses autonomous weapon system. They might not agree on whether that measure is demanded by IHL or is rather a practical response to the limits in the technology, but in, in practice, um, they would all agree that some kind of measures are needed in order to ensure that um, compliance with IHL, that a user can comply with IHL. And the types of measures that we identified that can help ensure compliance with IHL are. Well, there are three types. The first is control over the parameters of the autonomous weapon system. The second is control over the environment of use. And the third is control through human machine interaction. Those of you who listened to me yesterday heard me talk about 
these three elements from a military perspective, but they are also relevant from a legal perspective. I can see that I'm running very short on time, and so I won't go into detail about the um, specifics of each type of um, measure of control, but suffice it to say that it's this area that um, I think should be the focus of discussions in the GGE, that is the question of what IHL demands of states, of parties to conflict, and of commanders, what is the standard that is demanded by IHL, and how can this standard be met in practice when using autonomous weapon systems, what measures are needed in order to ensure compliance with IHL. And it's really this um, kind of discussion that I think will help states address the broader question um, at stake in the GGE, which is whether IHL is sufficiently clear and sufficiently strong to address their concerns about autonomous weapon systems. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt, Meta. Are you over? Mm -hmm. I was going to interrupt you. <laughs> anyway, so thank you very much for, for your presentation. And uh, well, we have like a lot of questions in, in the chat, but it, that is going to be later. And uh, thank you for describing all these uh, challenges that uh, uh, we have in the different aspects of the IHL I, and, and what you've been saying and also what has been said for the first a speaker, it's uh, being the GG work is going to be a challenge itself. So uh, uh, I'm going to give uh, the floor now to um, uh, Dr. Thompson Tengeta. Uh, Thompson is an European Research Council Fellow on Drone Violence and AI Ethics at the University of Southampton, where he undertakes research and project related leadership on autonomous weapon systems. His PhD thesis, the University of Pretoria, was on international law and ethics relevant to the government of Oz, while the LLM thesis in the Harvard Law School was on elements that define human control over Oz. As a researcher from the former UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary of Arbitrary Execution, Professor Kristen Haynes Thompson participated in the research and drafting of the current UN CCW discussion on, discussion on laws. Thompson is an executive board member of the Foundation for Responsibility Robotics and also serves as an expert member of the International Panel on the Regulation of Oz and the International Committee for Robots Arms Control. He is an, the African region lead for the campaign to stop killer robots. So, Dr. Chingeta, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria, for the uh, for the introductions, and I would want also to thank Unity for the invitation, and also to thank my fellow panelists who have uh, spoken before me. So, without wasting time, I would want to start by noting that recently, you know, particularly as contained in the guiding principles of the UNGGE on laws, it has been emphasized that international humanitarian law applies to auton autonomous weapon systems. It has also been emphasized that there should be compliance with international humanitarian law and that states should comply with their obligation to conduct legal reviews of new weapons. With respect, while I understand the rationale behind this emphasis, I think we must be very careful not to create a straw man Right from 2013, when the debate on autonomous weapon systems started, it was not whether IHL applies to autonomous weapon systems, but rather one of the key considerations was whether existing law is sufficient to regulate autonomous weapon systems. Thus, in my view, overemphasizing that international humanitarian law applies to autonomous weapon systems is in a way responding to an argument that never was. Now, in Professor Haynes' uh, 2013 report to the UN uh, Human Rights Council, a report uh, that I was privileged to contribute to as Professor Haynes as researcher, one of the recommendations particularly made in paragraph 114D 
to the United Nations and to states was that there is a need for an assessment of the adequacy or shortcomings of existing and domestic legal frameworks governing autonomous open systems. All the other chairs reports from the UNCCW, uh, UNCCW from 2014 up to 2018 captures in various paragraphs the discussions of states on whether existing law is adequate to govern autonomous open systems. Today, this question has never been resolved, yet recently it appears this question is slowly disappearing without an answer. You know, there are reasons why I believe it is important to uh, answer the question whether existing law is sufficient to govern autonomous open systems. First, as captured in paragraph 51b of the chair's 2015 report, an answer to this question is a determinant factor indeed to the kind of policy recommendation on autonomous open systems that the UNGGE will make. For example, the need for a new regulation is dependent on the determination whether or not existing law is adequate to govern autonomous open systems. And second, attempts to operationalize and comply with the law that is inadequate will not fully address the concerns that are posed by autonomous open systems, particularly ethical concerns. Now, I am uh, fully aware that there are different views that have been expressed as far as sufficient or otherwise of existing law is concerned. But the question which I constantly ask is that are there solid counter arguments to the position that as far as governance of autonomous open system is concerned, there is a lacuna or a legal gap? In 2016, the delegation from Canada aptly defined a legal gap as a situation where the absence of a law or a legal norm prevents an inherently illegal situation from being addressed or where the applicable law is incomplete. It was also noted that a lacuna or illegal gap can be the absence of something that arguably ought to be there. Now, in 2018, the ICRC in its report, which is reflective of the position of many states and scholars, noted that the concerns that are raised or the issues that are raised by autonomous open systems go beyond the mere consideration of applicability of our laws or compliance with our laws to encompass issues of acceptability to our values. Likewise, Switzerland and, and many other states, for example, Switzerland in its 2017 working paper submitted to the UNGGE, particularly on paragraph 20, makes the same uh, notes to say that a situation where many humans, particularly machines, starts now making considerations or calculations or carrying out tasks which we have been traditionally reserved for human combatants is something that falls outside what uh, the parameters of international humanitarian law can adequately address. Now, the same again and similar uh, challenges were noted by CIPRI, particularly in its 2015 report, which you can check at pages 10 to 11. Under existing law, I can say that we, while we may be uh, more fully able to discuss the question, can autonomous weapon systems do it? In other words, the question whether can autonomous weapon system comply with existing law, it is impossible to adequately discuss the, the question, should autonomous weapon system do it? Which is a very fundamental question, particularly this question it straddles into issues of morality and ethics, which I do not believe are sufficiently covered under existing law. Now, in the 2013 report that I've already mentioned, Haynes clearly states that you know the consideration of, of the question, should they do it, can actually be an overriding consideration. And to the same effect, in the 2018 report of the ICRC, which I've also aforementioned, it is mentioned that 
issues of human dignity, issues of uh, diffusion of moral responsibility may have the most far-reaching consequences and perhaps precluding the development and use of autonomous open systems. Yet, as I've mentioned, some of these ethical considerations may not necessarily be part of existing law. Sure, something that ought to be there is not there in our law. It is a lacuna, it is a legal gap. To all this, the counter argument that I've come across of red, or, 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 or which I hear, usually restate bowed assertions that autonomous open systems or that international humanitarian law, pardon me, is sufficient to govern autonomous open systems, that states will commit to rigorous legal reviews of new weapons, and that after all, if there is a gap, the Martin's clause, you know, will protect civilians. Let me briefly respond to this. First, it is important to note that the utility of legal reviews of new weapons depends on whether or not in the first place existing law is adequate. I believe that that which is inadequate cannot serve as a yardstick. And therefore, for a res to respond to the argument that existing law is inadequate by emphasizing compliance with existing law or rigorous application of Article uh, 36 legal reviews is in a, in a way for me uh, secular reason because it is based on a faulty premise. Switzerland to this end in 2017 working paper, not particularly on paragraph 20, that some of the issues that are raised by autonomous weapon systems fall outside the scope of an Article 36 legal review. No wonder why, for example, in March 2019, the ICRC in its intervention and the UNGGE observed importantly as follows. While legal reviews may be important, they are not a substitute for states working towards internationally agreed limits on autonomy. Now, I want to go to my final point regarding the issue of the role of the Martins Clause. You know, the idea that if the law is inadequate, the Martins Clause will fill the gaps is doubtful in as far as its usefulness is concerned, because the gaps that are created by autonomous open systems, as I've already noted, are too wide for them to be covered by something that is not actually codified into law. And I liked particularly one of my co the, uh, the first speaker, Prof. Batikiata, sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, when he knows that the Martin clause, is, clause has never been an end in itself, but rather it, is, it actually needs to be translated into predictable and comprehensible uh, uh, legal instruments if there, if there is that need. Now, there, there are several critical issues regarding the issue of public conscience as enunciated in the, in the matters clause, which I also want to mention. Some of the questions which I cannot fully discuss because of time, but I will all the same. Just ask those questions for your consideration. And these are the follows. Th these questions are as follows. When we talk about dictates of public conscience, which public and whose conscience? In the UNGGE, is there a public whose conscience is privileged by virtue of power relations and the structure of the UN? Is there a public whose conscience is ignored, whether intentionally or unintentionally, by virtue of systemic and structural racism that permeates international organizations, including the UN? What are the chances, after all, of a consensus on public conscience given the UN, UNGGE, that the fact that UNGGE operates on consensus. Noting that public conscience should not be you know, equated to public opinion, uh, but rather should be seen as entailing moral obligations and ethics. UNIDI in 2015, in its report, noted correctly on paragraph seven, that the best place sometimes to look for emerging norms of uh, dictate of, of uh, dictates of public conscience, it, our public forums like the UNGGE, it further noted that the emerging notion of human control is an indicator of public conscience. But then, what happened to the notion of human control? This indicator of public conscience 
August 2019 discussions at the UNGGE, a very few states argued that they did not want the term human control in the chess report. The views of those very few states won the day against those of the majority. Who dictates dictates of public conscience on the issue of autonomous open systems? Finally, in his 2019 working paper to the UNGGE, Argentina asked whether the Martins Clause is taken into consideration uh, within legal review mechanism of, a, of new weapons, and if so, how? There were no satisfactory answers that were given. It is to no wonder why Unity, again in 2015, noted that the concept of dictates of public conscience is difficult to operationalize. Thus, in my view and in conclusion, what is needed is a new legal instrument created around the notion of human control over use of force as informed by both legal norms and ethical considerations. If I am to end with a note of what was being referred by the first speaker again on the uh, issues uh, of targeting of, uh, of uh, the, an Iranian general, I should ask again on the questions of public conscience when I say uh, what detects public conscience, what forms or what informs public conscience. I've wondered in the same manner because drones were used, which, which are similar to some, to some extent to autonomous systems, if the individual involved was European, was American, if the targeting happened in America, if the targeting happened in Europe, would be the formulation of public opinion and also public conscience on the issue be the same? So this consideration when actually we also discusses issues of public conscience regarding these particular technologies, we should perhaps be also alive to that. With that, I want to thank you again for giving me this brief opportunity to uh, discuss some of these views. Thank you very much, Dr. Chengeta, for this uh, comprehensive uh, approach. Also, to flag this thing of moral and ethics that is not really enough considered under international humanitarian law and this uh, question that is in there about uh, public conscience. Um, we don't have too much time for questions. There are only like 10 minutes. And we already have some questions in the in the program to address both of you, but also there are some questions in the chat. So uh, I'm going to pose the uh, three questions. So I I, I, I pick uh, a couple from the chat, and uh, <clears throat> and for you just to be like brief to answer uh, all together if that uh, okay for you. So the first question is how we can ensure that IHL will continue to be applied at every step of developing and using emerging technology in the areas of laws and limits be determined before, beforehand, for example, temporal and special limits. There is something that you, that, uh, that Meta uh, already speak about. The other question is about an assumption that machines can better fulfill the requirement posed by law of armed complex, most notably distinction, proportionality and precaution. Is there any international law that prohibit humans to delegate machines to make a decision of whom to kill? Assume those who use uh, such weapon systems will be always aware of the responsibility of the result. And uh, <clears throat> there is a question from the chat from uh, Leonardo, the mission of uh, of Brazil that uh, he wants to ask about what are your views on the current legal gaps regarding accountability and responsibility for the use of laws. So I give you the floor and ask uh, uh, to be brief, please. Thank you very much. Thompson, would you like to um, address the questions or do you want me to go ahead? Uh, oh, I, 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 I'm, I can uh, go ahead if, uh, if, uh, if you, if you do not mind. Please. Okay. Um, I, I would like perhaps firstly uh, to, to address the second questions on, on the issue of, um, uh, you know, assumptions on uh, machines performing better. 
And, with, and I answer this with a very uh, great respect to the person who posed the question, but I'm not sure if these questions uh, can be helpful uh, in this debate. Uh, in my view, you know, you cannot make an assumption of uh, that which is already known to be wrong. Uh, making, you know, some of these assumptions, you know, that I mean, uh, you know, asking me to make some of these assumptions, at least in my in my view, will lead some time perhaps to a uh, logically flawed debate. It is like one saying, for example, assuming that theft was not a crime, is there any law that criminalizes stealing? You know, machines cannot be uh, better than humans on issues such as proportionality that requires value judgments or and situational awareness. Something that machines are incapable of. I think Neta has already, uh, you know, touched on some some of those things. One cannot, for for example, also assume that combatants will always be responsible for war crimes, because an essential element of a crime is intention, mens rea. It is not, uh, you know, a strict liability affair, so to say. So once that is taken away where uh, machines have autonomy in the critical functions, then, you know, we cannot make that assumption. So it is difficult for me to proceed on, on, on those assumptions, so to say. Nevertheless, as said in my presentation, I'll say this. The fundamental consideration may not necessarily be about whether machines can outperform humans. Rather, uh, it is whether from an ethical standpoint, uh, machines should have such power to begin with. This is where I say this fundamental consideration is perhaps not sufficiently covered in existing law and hence the need for a new legal instrument. Briefly on the on the on the on the second question, uh, on the first question, so to say, on how IHO uh, how can, we can ensure that IHO continue to be applied at every step of developing uh, the use of emerging technologies. In my view, again, to ensure that IHO is uh, you know complied with at the developmental stage, we have to make sure that the law itself and existing legal reviews are fit for purpose, that they are uh, you know sufficient to serve as an as, as an effective yardstick, and currently they are not. To bring them up to debt, there is need to elevate and codify the notion of human control as a legal principle that ought to be considered during legal reviews. It will uh, mean that the system that do not meet that agreed minimum legal standard on human control will not pass a legal review. In other words, such a weapon becomes Ill an illegal weapon per se. You know. Then on issues of usage, at the usage part, I just wanted to make comments where perhaps I may differ a little bit with uh, uh, my co-panelist Neta on issues of temporal and spatial limitation. I, I have reservations because in my, in, uh, you know, if a human does not participate in the making of the decision to use force in real time, the issue of temporal and spatial limitations may be of no consequence, at least in my view. It may not matter that the system is activated for only a few minutes within a limited area, you know, in a split second, the situation on the battlefield field can change. Machines lack that situation awareness to, to recognize that. So I can only discuss issues of temporal limitations and situational awareness when I'm talking of weapons that are already, or systems that are already legal. But if we're talking uh, autonomy in, in, in it wouldn't matter if there's autonomy in its critical functions. It wouldn't matter how you limit time and where it operates. It is still unpredictable and, in my view, uh, unacceptable. Um, well, as always, Thompson, I find your, your views are very compelling on this and, and I don't have a lot to add um, beyond what, what you have already said in response to the questions. Um, what I wanted to do is maybe illustrate in a little bit more detail practically the kinds of measures that uh, could be taken uh, in order to um, uh, support uh, and ensure compliance with IHL uh, for the when using autonomous weapon systems. I'm talking about using autonomous weapon systems because that's really the crux of the matter and where the real consequences and risks lie. But I'm going to also mention uh, events pre and, and post use in a moment. So just very briefly. Um, during my presentation, I mentioned controls over the parameters of uh, autonomous weapon systems as a way um, that um, uh, IHL can be complied with when using autonomous weapons and in practice what this means is constraining the type of target that an autonomous weapon system may select as well as potentially constraints aimed at preventing um, the application of force on or near certain protected objects such as 
you know, ambulances, hospitals. Um, and, you know, to, to come back to Thompson's point, in certain circumstances, it, you know, I, I can foresee that it might be reasonable for a user to assume that from the moment of activation, all of the objects in the area of operate of the autonomous weapon systems operation would conform to the target profiles or other kinds of technical indicators that are used by the system um, to and ensure that no application of force would possibly fall foul of, of, of IHL in that context. And that's particularly possible to imagine in the case of um, weapons that are intended to target um, objects that are military objectives by their nature, such as a military naval vessel or an incoming missile. But it's more difficult to imagine that um, kind of certainty with respect to objects that are not military objectives by their nature, like, you know, bridges, um, because it's, it's unpredictable, as Thompson said. When it comes to spatial or temporal limitations, they, they can, I think, help to a user to exert the kind of control um, that they need in order to comply with IHL, although the exact duration, the exact limit uh, in space is not something that IHL identifies and would depend on the context. Um, and again, sometimes you can imagine that that would be sufficient, like in a situation where there are no civilians present, no risk of civilians being present, um, but in a mixed environment or in a highly unpredictable environment or dynamic environment, as Thompson pointed out, those kinds of temporal or spatial limitations are unlikely to be sufficient on their own to um, support compliance with IHL. And finally, human machine interaction, this type of kind of control is about um, supervising or retaining the ability to intervene or even deactivate an autonomous weapon system during its operation in order to ensure that there is uh, no um, risk of IHL violations. Now, this is during the use, but when we're talking about the entire um, span of time from the design of the weapon system all the way through to a post-use assessment, these are the exact kinds of measures or criteria that, as Thompson mentioned, should be thought about at the legal review stage, at the design and development stage. And, you know, when looking retrospectively, um, should be considered when asking the question whether an individual or indeed a state has complied with their obligation um, under IHL after an attack has taken place. And especially if that attack has caused harm to civilians or civilian objects. And just finally, if I can um, also just address um, the question uh, that was posed in the, the guiding question that was posed in advance regarding the ability of um, autonomous weapon systems to better comply with IHL. Like Thompson, I, I take objection to this kind of um, this kind of conceptualization of autonomous weapon systems. Because, as I said, it is always the user who is required to comply with IHL, not the weapon system itself. No matter how complex, no matter how sophisticated, no matter how advanced the technology is, the question to ask is whether the user is able to make the context-specific, value-based judgments demanded of them by IHL. In some cases, the technology may be able to assist the user to make those assessments. So I'm thinking, for example, of the ability to enhance a targeter's vision of the target area. That's technology that can help to um, ensure that IHL is complied with. In other situations, technology can hinder or interfere with a user's ability to make the judgments demanded of them by IHL. And those are the um, risks that that need to be uh, taken into account. Thank you very much, uh, Neta. Thank you very much, uh, Thompson. Uh, there is uh, there is need for more time for these questions and uh, to discuss and uh, needs to go maybe deeper, not only here, but also in the discussions during the during the GGE and, and, and something like the role of the commander and something of the user that you, that you flag at the, at the end of the, your reply. I think that it is key, like just a system not to be only predictable, but also to be understandable and not always this kind of uh, 
this kind of technology is uh, understandable. But so thank you very much for your participation. It's really very useful and it's a pity that we don't have like this enough time to go through all the questions on the chat. So I'm, I'm very sorry for all the participants as well. So now I'm going to give uh, to turn to Pauline again for the next uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia, and thank you for our speakers. And we will uh, turn now to the, the second panel where we will uh, find uh, uh, Professor Ray Lihoja and uh, Professor also uh, Leng Xinyu. So we have been speaking about broad concepts of IHL uh, at the moment and of a concept as, as the, the Martins Clause and, and the, the human control in theory, but also with some practical uh, application. I invite you now to listen our, to our panelists that were asked to dive into those practical application of IHL, specifically in the conduct of hostilities and also after regarding the concept of responsibility, but also accountability. And to meet uh, those challenges, I'm very pleased to leave the floor now to Professor Rain Livoja, who is an associate professor at the Queensland Law School um, in Australia. And he's also the lead of the uh, Law of War Research Group that just launched uh, last week, I think, a series of podcasts on the law and the future of war. They're very interesting. And I invite you to check them uh, on the internet. Ren has published uh, in international law issues, various international to relating to the law of armed conflict and governance of armed forces. And he's also co editor on the Journal of International Humanitarian Legal. Um, studies, among many other things that I invite you to check on our if you want your turn. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Pauline. Um, so hello, everyone. And, and first of all, thank you for coming along to this, this semi series of webinars. Uh, and also thanks to the organizers, uh, Giacomo and Pauline in particular, for extending me an invitation. If you see strange flashes of light and strange sounds during my presentation. I apologize. It's not conduct of hostilities. It's a fairly heavy thunderstorm that has uh, hit Brisbane um, tonight. So I've been asked to talk about the implementation of IHL principles um, in the context of autonomous um, weapon systems. And it seems to me that in light of the really excellent panel that we've, we've just heard, um, uh, I actually have very little to add. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll still try to make a couple of observations and perhaps pick up a, a few of the questions that have been popping up uh, in the chat uh, as I go along. But before I get to the substance, uh, just a quick note on, on definitions. Um, so I view autonomous weapon systems as being weapon systems that once activated can select and engage targets without requiring fur further human intervention. Uh, so along the lines as autonomous weapons have been um, defined both by the US Department of Defense and the ICRC. Um, there's a question that has uh, arisen both in the chat today and in one of the earlier uh, webinars around distinctions between automatic versus autonomous, uh, semi-autonomous versus fully autonomous um, weapon systems. I don't think that the distinctions are terribly helpful for the discussion. Um, in that I don't think that there's a particularly principled basis for drawing the line between these different categories of weapons. The differences seem to be uh, uh, largely a matter of degree um, and, and not of kind. These are all weapon systems that don't have a real-time human um, a trigger puller uh, such that those systems can operate for smaller or, or, or greater periods of time uh, without direct human um, interactions. Interaction and, and from that perspective, of course, autonomous weapons um, uh, have been around for a while. Uh, uh, but what is creating difficulties is the increased sophistication uh, of those systems and the degree of autonomy that they have. And on definitions, also a point on on the notion of laws. Um, so I take the lethal autonomous weapon systems to, to be a, a, a particular term of art used uh, in the GGE context for autonomous systems quote unquote, of concern. Um, I, I don't think that the lethality question there is particularly significant. I think it's more a question of uh, uh, the level of, of autonomy uh, in, in the system that would make uh, certain autonomous weapon systems uh, a matter of concern for the international community. 
So let me turn to the substance now. Um, there's often a common question raised whether an autom uh, autonomous weapon system can comply with or implement um, international humanitarian uh, law rules or principles. And that can lead to a discussion of the technical capabilities of the systems and the nature of legal judgments, whether they are evaluative or not, and so on and so forth. But I think the question is, strictly speaking, beside the point. Um, it presupposes that a human is being replaced by a machine, um, and the machine in turn takes on this quasi-human uh, quality um, and uh, is in a position to apply rules and principles of international uh, humanitarian law. And that strikes me as anthropomorphizing the system, something that the GG has several times emphasized that, that we ought not do. So I would respectfully submit the proper question is, can states and humans who decide on the use of autonomous weapon systems ensure compliance of the resulting application of force with IHL? Or put slightly differently, are autonomous weapon systems capable of using or capable of being used in compliance with IHL? And taking this perspective has some implications for how one looks at distinction uh, proportionality and precautionary measures. So when it comes to distinction, it's not really determinative from a legality point of view, whether an autonomous weapon system can make a distinction between civilian objects and military objects, for example. Rather, the question is whether a particular system under particular circumstances can sufficiently distinguish between various categories of objects such that the user of the system has reasonable certainty that only those objects that qualify as military objectives are targeted. So consequently, it would be unlawful to de deploy an autonomous weapon system that cannot distinguish, for example, between tanks and school buses in an environment where school buses are present, whereas that ability to distinguish is not relevant in circumstances where one is unlikely to find uh, school buses. So secondly, as far as uh, proportionality is concerned, things are perhaps slightly more complicated, um, considering that the rule requires the balancing of collateral damage and military advantage, uh, which has I think, correctly been described by the other panelists as an evaluative uh, uh, judgment, which seems to require a, a subjective decision making. Um, as a footnote, I'll, I'll, I'll raise a question here. It, it's actually interesting that in this particular context, uh, we seem to like the idea of subjective decision making, whereas in most other contexts, we want an objective uh, way of decision making. So I'm actually wondering, uh, and I think Mark, Marco Sassoli uh, has this, raised this point before, uh, uh, whether on, uh, autonomous weapon systems might actually force us to think a little bit more objectively about the way in which we uh, uh, measure um, uh, collateral damage and proportionality. But when it comes to autonomous weapon systems, there are two ways of dealing with the problem of uh, evaluative judgment uh, on the assumption that the system itself cannot make such a judgment. The first is that the system can only be deployed in circumstances where collateral damage is entirely unlikely, um, so subsurface um, um, submarine warfare, or where collateral damage is extremely or, or is likely to be minimal, so remote, uh, uninhabited uh, areas. The second option is that, assuming the system can distinguish between at least different types of objects, a human could make uh, a decision beforehand in terms of what kind of collateral damage is acceptable with respect to particular targets. So, I mean, those seem to be the practical ways of getting around the problem uh, of the system not being able to make evaluative um, judgments. Perhaps one more point is worth noting when it comes to proportionality, and that is that there's perhaps sometimes an assumption that um, uh, an autonomous weapon system must be allowed to operate at the very margins of tolerable uh, collateral damage. And because an autonomous weapon system cannot make uh, judgments uh, sort of at the higher end of tolerable collateral damage, uh, they cannot be used at all. Um, but it's worth noting here that armed forces rarely delegate to soldiers the ability to make proportionality decisions that go to the very maximum limit of permissible collateral uh, damage. There are, also, uh, there are often rules of engagement in place that limit 
the ability of soldiers to to apply the use of force, even in circumstances where it would be uh, permissible uh, under the law. Um, so, um, um, and you may, may have an arrangement whereby more complicated uh, proportionality decisions have to be made uh, further or higher up in, in the chain of command. And there's no particular reason to think why an autonomous system uh, could not be designed in a similar manner, in the sense that it needs to seek human input in circumstances uh, where it detects a, a situation where collateral damage uh, might be caused. Um, thirdly, precautions. So precautionary measures under IHL are themselves subject to a feasibility standard, which introduces a degree of flexibility depending on the means uh, and methods of warfare used. And this is in distinction from uh, the, the principle of distinction and proportionality, which are not uh, uh, subject to, to a feasibility standard. They're, they're absolute uh, requirements. Um, an autonomous open system might be capable of taking some precautionary measures, so for example, uh, issuing warnings, but to the extent that it cannot do so, it is basically the responsibility of the human operator to take precautionary measures. Uh, the difficulty there arises, as, as Netta has very uh, eloquently explained, from the uh, potentially long periods for which the weapon system operates. So it's difficult for the operator to take precautionary measures in relation to a, a long period of operation um, uh, on the, of, of the weapon system, which might then have the effect that uh, um, users can only um, sort of use autonomous weapon systems for fairly limited uh, periods of time. I should also note here that the choice between an autonomous weapon system and a different system is in itself a precautionary measure and one uh, that has to be taken by the operator or the user. So the user needs to make the decision whether under particular circumstances an autonomous weapon system uh, could be used to minimize collateral damage, for example, or whether a manually operated system um, ought to be used. Peculiarly, this might lead to the conclusion that in some circumstances, um, a, a weapon system with some autonomous fun functionality should be used because it res results in um, uh, reduced uh, collateral uh, damage. And I agree with the point made earlier uh, by Thompson and, and Netta that it's not appropriate to compare a person to an autonomous weapon system in terms of the effects of the use of force. We rather need to compare a person using a manually operated system and a person using an autonomous weapon system and make an evaluation in terms of what, which of them might lead to better humanitarian consequences when it comes to uh, 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 the rule requiring precautionary uh, measures. And my discussion of these three core rules of international law really comes back to what uh, uh, Netta was saying about the three variables, the technological constraints, the environmental constraints, and the human machine interaction when it comes to um, governing autonomous uh, weapon systems. It is the combination of these variables that must result in the use of force that complies with IHL. Um, and manipulating the technological and environmental constraints so as to achieve a lawful outcome using an autonomous system is sometimes referred to um, as um, a boxed autonomy. Uh, and so my conclusion basically is that a human or a state can only delegate decisions to an, a system, to an autonomous system, if it reasonably thinks that uh, 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 this decision results in action that is compliant with international humanitarian law. When I mean, there are interesting questions around what degree of confidence the user, the individual or the state must have, uh, and that probably is an issue that requires some further exploration. Uh, but I know that that's not an altogether novel question um, uh, uh, because there's, that there isn't a 100% confidence in existing weapon systems. Uh, every weapon has some margin of error. Uh, a missile that has a circular error probable of five meters um, has a 50% chance of missing any target that is big, that is smaller than 10 meters. And the question there is that is, is this type of a margin of error somehow different from the type of error that uh, an autonomous system uh, uh, might engage in? But let me circle back to operationalization, which is what the organizers uh, uh, wanted me to sort of turn to. 
So the conclusion is a somewhat uneasy one uh, in that it's very difficult to say in the abstract what kind of human-machine interaction is required. That would seem to depend on the type of weapon and the types of constraints that can be placed on the weapon beforehand and the intended use and the environment um, uh, in which the weapon uh, is deployed. So I think the only thing that we can really say in, in abstract uh, when it comes to IHL is that IHL requires such human-machine interaction as may be necessary to ensure compliance with IHL. And what kind of human-machine interaction is required depends on the weapon system and the environment, which to me suggests that it's going to be very difficult coming up with uh, a, a common legal standard across all weapon systems and across all uh, domains um, of warfare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Livoda, for this presentation that is, uh, as ever, very clear, very interesting, instructive. And I have an immediate purpose uh, question about what you said. So, as apparently this is possible to, to limit the domain of intervention, the environment, the time uh, of operation of the, of the weapon system, but also the kind of control that you can have on, on this weapon system. And uh, basically, one of the main issue, the issue of trust, or one of the main questions, the question of trust in, into the system. What's the, 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 the very difference between those systems and the complex operation that we are seeing nowadays? where you have an operator in a CAIC in one country that is operating, that is giving the order to uh, some flying crew in another country to attack a target in a third country based on the information on the ground of people that are not from the same nation and that are saying that there is a target to strike at one moment and that is urgent because it's a different situation and you don't have eyes on the target. Basically, this is also trust. Trust in human and trust the chain of command. What's the the very difference between those two approaches? The trust in the machine and the uh, in in the human and and can we try to overcome those challenges by the parameters that would be or could be possibly implemented into the the weapon system? For instance, the NC on the rules of engagement. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's an, that's an excellent and, and, and a very complicated question. So the, the issue of under what circumstances human uh, trust, humans trust machines uh, and autonomous machines in particular um, is the subject of a, lot of, of a lot of research and technology is being designed in such a way that would make it uh, uh, easier for humans to appropriately trust the system. And I say appropriately because there's both a, a, a danger of under-reliance or a lack of trust in a system and a danger of over-reliance or too much trust in a system. And there, there are various uh, factors, um, uh, understanding how the system uh, operates, um, uh, general familiarity with technology and the personal preferences of a person uh, in dealing with a particular uh, uh, technology that, that play a role. Um, so, from a sort of a human factors perspective or a human machine inter interaction perspective, uh, uh, yeah, so fine tuning the level of trust between a system and machine is a very important one. But I, I don't think that as a lawyer, I'm, I'm particularly competent to answer uh, uh, sort of how that trust can be uh, can be achieved. Thank you very much for your answer. And for those who were there on Monday, there was a discussion about this topic from the technological side with Professor Nadabi from uh, Professor uh, Vanina Martinez. Uh, from the use on the field, we are now um, trying to see what could be the aftermath with uh, Professor uh, um, Leng Xinyu, who is joining us uh, from uh, China today. And I thank you very much for serving with us. So, Professor Xinyu is currently working for the School of Law, China University of Political Science and Law, and he's teaching in researching international criminal law and international humanitarian law, uh, notably. He has been publishing on numerous, is numerous issues, notably uh, on war crime and the UN security, but also in um, in the broader term on arms conflict and the, uh, the weapons. Professor, thank you very much for being uh, with us uh, today, and I pass you the floor to speak about responsibility, accountability, and the development and use of data autonomous systems. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, I'm very glad. Uh, and Pauline got my contacts at very late stage. So I just wondered if I could attend this uh, wonderful meetings here. But finally, we have a channel with each other. And I'm very honored. I'm pleased to attend this meeting. And uh, my question assigned was uh, the issue of uh, responsibility or accountability. Uh, 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 I would like to introduce uh, something that I, uh, that uh, uh, the approaches and that I applied to look at this question and uh, discuss it from the perspective of the doctrines or serious uh, under the background of international criminal laws. So, is it possible for us to uh, to fill in the gap, the accountability gap, by just by using the existing rules or, or doctrines of international criminal law or not? So, uh, that is actually the main concern. So, so the question. Uh, the, the the premise of my question is, uh, if some states or, or some non-state actors uh, in armed conflict used the alternative weapons systems and uh, which errone erroneously uh, attacked some objects and caused a violation of international humanitarian laws, so and then who should be responsible for that? Uh, should we just uh, transfer the responsibility to the autonomous weapon system, or there must be some human beings uh, who should be responsible for that, whether the commander or designer or the operator, uh, whoever? Uh, yeah, yeah, that that uh, that's the that's the question. So uh, my starting point is uh, uh, I just want to check and you know, whether there are. Uh, some jurisprudences on uh, currently under international criminal law to look at this problem here. So very frequently, uh, the the early case is very uh, very scarcely discussed in this question, but uh, uh, we have one. That we have one. So uh, it is a case before the international criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, uh, not very early uh, on 2014, uh, the trial chamber judgments, and then uh, one, almost one year later. Uh, the appeals chamber judgments delivers their uh, delivers the appeal judgments uh, on the question. Uh, I mean, the prosecutor versus Sir Gosovina, a general of of Croatia, uh, who uh, who ordered his army to to uh, to show to show that the, the municipalities and the small towns uh, in Bosnia. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, in a very detailed question was discussed. What about the the gap? If the soldiers under the command are used the artillerists uh, of the BM-21, the rockets, artillery, or, or the wizards, and uh, they intentionally choose the targets, the military targets, but finally uh, the artillerists attack the, the wrong, uh, the, the, the wrong objects. Uh, they just attack the civilian populations and the civilian uh, civilian properties. Then. Uh, should it be uh, the responsibility of the general uh, Gorovina uh, to be responsible for that or anybody else? So that's the question. This is the first time I found a case in, in international criminal law where discuss the relationship between human beings and the and and the weapon systems. Yeah, but the uh, but what I found in the jurisprudence of the appeals chamber. Uh, it was very clear. They just said the image. They just said the image, and the all the attack by the weapon systems was the reflection of the intention and judgments of the human beings. So what we see from the outcome of the attacks is actually the outcome of the behavior of the human beings. So there is no there is no room for the discussion of the AI applications in the weapon systems. Uh, so what I found is uh, traditionally. Uh, without the AWS and the autonomous weapon systems, and or, or what we learned from uh, from the perspective of military, or what we learned from a practical uh, perspective, is that the consistency uh, between the weapon systems and the human behavior, sir. But or now we nowadays we have the AWS or with the AI applications. And then what we found is the inconsistency, inconsistency uh, of the weapon system and the human beings. So the inconsistency is is the starting point for for my research work. So so uh, we we can analyze it from the men's rear and also from the perspective of the, of the S rear, uh, access risk. 
from the perspective of active research, so the question is, sir, is there any causal link or causal relationship between the human beings' behavior, the operator, and the and the weapon system? And from the mass rear, so how could the human beings interact with the uh, interact with the the the, the weapon systems? So uh, if we if if we check both the elements of the war crimes, actor, both actor risk and actor stress and mass rear, uh, my answer is negative. On both sides, the negative. So uh, when the people stay outside the loop, uh, uh, you cannot always predict what, what what was the next steps of the AWS. And if you stay on the loop. There is sometimes, and there is always sometimes that the human beings lost the communication uh, between uh, the lost the communication with the uh, with the weapon systems. So let me give you an example. For example, the UUV, the unmanned underwater vehicles, uh, is now developed by the United States and of course by my by my countries. But if the UUV are utilized as a as a weapon system, which can work, can function underwater. So uh, it, that's quite normal for us to know. So it is almost impossible for the for the military troops to establish the instant communications with the weapon system. So it have to uh, rely on the autonomy of the weapon system to function. So that's the question. So that's the question. So when we talk about the AI, uh, when we talk about the autonomous weapon system, uh, and uh, uh, when we talk about the erroneous attack, uh, uh, I don't think I don't think it, it is because of the the autonomous weapon system are very small. So they can think, they can compute, and they can uh, they can predict, and they can also work as the human beings are uh, as the human beings just do. Yeah, they may mistake it just because they are not so smart. They are not so smart, and sometimes they just lose out of the control. Are uh, they are they are out of the control of the human beings, so that's the uh, that's the physical limits what we can see from the the autonomous weapon systems, and so this causes uh, we cannot easily establish a causal link uh, from the perspective of actual spheres and uh, cannot uh, find a applicable standard or criteria to assess uh, how the weapon system and human beings interact. So uh, let us come to the, the the next question. The next question is: Is there any is there any forms of responsibility which could be applied, as suggested by some experts, could be applied to analyze the Weapon system and human relationships. For example, somebody suggested the uh, uh, commander responsibility could be applied. Somebody suggested uh, we can view just a view the weapon system and the operator as as a joint criminal enterprises. Uh, the, juris, the jurisprudence of ICTY or the co-perpetrator uh, the co-perpetration relationships. Uh, that is that is the jurisprudence of ICC. So, no, uh, but my question is negative. Negative. So all of the existing doctrines or of the responsibility mechanisms are all used to analyze the relation, uh, relationships between the human beings, but are not applicable to analyze the relationship between the human and the machines. So, so that's the question. So in a shared situation awareness, how can we keep the the, the awareness of situations or uh, could keep consistencies between the human beings and the uh, and the autonomous weapon systems. I'm not sure. This is actually depends on the the control system. I mean the command control system and also the communication link and also the 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 reliability of the, the reliability and the function of the sensories of the whole system. So 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 that is the question why the criminal responsibility issues are are very very complicated, but as suggestions, as suggestions, if we dis just discuss it, there's uh, in a very specific, very particular circumstances, so we can easily draw a conclusion. Yeah, for most of the cases, a weapon system are applied in the battlefield, and uh, <coughs> it, 
and uh, the specific counts of war crimes could be considered. And in every time people would just to check whether this kind of used as a criminal tools uh, applied by the operator or, or the field commanders to commit war crimes, whether it is within or it is within or uh, so just out of the sphere of the mental elements, so that could be very easy uh, when we consider the particular sequences of the uh, of the battlefield. So uh, basically, I agree with the position of the working paper, which was submitted by United States in I think in 2017 or or last year, which suggests that in most of the cases, in most of the cases when the war crimes were uh, were considered. Uh, uh, if the AWS could be the reflection of the human judgments and uh, the intention of the operators, so then the responsibility issues are very clear. But in cases the uh, but in cases in the AWS uh, just to, uh, get out of the control of the human beings, and which is also unpredictable for the human beings, the responsibility. The responsibility uh, is not is unclear now, so so uh, the that is my approach. So finally, I would like to discuss the issue by dividing the situation into three categories. So the first category is, uh, uh, yes, the AWS make an attack based on its judgments of the uh, of the autonomy, but uh, it was uh, it was within the prediction and intention and control. Of the human beings. Uh, number two, uh, uh, number two, uh, yes, it was uh, the attack was out of the out of the control, but it still were predictable for the human beings. So, in this specific situation, I think it depends on whether responsibility exists. It depends on whether the specific elements of all crimes includes uh, a specific. Uh, a specific situation of uh, mens rea, I mean recklessness. And number three, and number three, uh, in the situation, the, the attack was totally out of control and it was also unpredictable for the human beings. So in this specific situation, so I don't think it is uh, fair to attribute the responsibility to the operator and the commanders of the field. So that's the most well, uh, most uh, most frequently dis discussed the question, and also uh, somebody dis discuss uh, somebody just proposed that the designers or programmers, or manufacturers should be accountable for that. So uh, my question is: Yes, it could be, it could be, uh, but uh, but it was not a responsibility under international law. We only have war crimes. We only have for. Of crimes against humanity, so the uh, the crime of genocide is irrelevant here. So under international law, so it seems the only war crimes uh, could uh, is is relevant. But under domestic law, it could be possible if the manufacturer or designer who intentionally provide the, the disqualify weapon systems or have some defects uh, in the algorithm or in the software providing to the military crews. And the military troops use it to, to erroneously attack to, uh, somebody or something, uh, violating the international humanitarian law. They could be responsible. So uh, let me give uh, everybody an example. Uh, when I checked the Penal Code of China, I found a specific uh, article uh, in the Penal Code of China, Article 330. So which just just to say, if you recklessness or intentionally provides the the weapon system with defects and of course the damage and then the designer or manufacturer should be responsible for this and also similar article sections in 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 the domestic law of the united states so uh, if we look at the designer or programmer yes of course under uh, domestic law okay thank you Pauline. Thank you very much, Professor, for your presentation on this very, very interesting issue because of it has been a question that has been keeping coming during the discussions uh, in the GT on law, but also we saw that we just had a question about this very topic. How can you ensure accountability and responsibility if the, the weapon system are used? And finally, if the outcome is not the one that was already planned and, and 
apart from the questions that were asked by uh, the registered participants, and I would like to thank them again for their involvement in, in making of this uh, series of webinar a success. Um, apart from those questions, then I, I have another question for you because of we are speaking about responsibility, accountability. You mentioned rightly the, the, that in the absence of menstrual and in the absence of recklessness, then you could not uh, achieve criminal responsibility. But this is not the only responsibility, or this is not the only way to try to hold somebody accountable and then to try to fill completely this accountability responsibility gap. And I was wondering whether this whole question, as the whole question of the application of IHL could be summarize in the word trust, uh, trust, sorry, in the system. Here, if the whole question of responsibility and accountability could be summarized in the word of risk, and who is taking the risk and who is taking the responsibility for taking the risk? And I will give you an example. So states uh, are responsible under international law for fulfilling then their international obligations. And one of their international obligations is to, to execute and to interpret and to apply the treaty with good faith. And if they are not doing this, then they can be accountable and responsible for a breach of international law. And one of their obligations is to apply and to abide by IHL, so for their personal and the conduct facilities, but also for them when they um, they apply IHL even before the conduct of facility, basically applying Article 36. Uh, uh, of uh, AP1 and more broadly for states that are not part of Article 36 in conduct legal reviews. Would this notion of accountability and responsibility, could this notion of accountability and responsibility be summarized in the term of risk? Is the state um, taking the risk to purchase those weapons or to develop those weapons? Could the state be accountable or could the, the commander or the soldier on the field deciding to use that kind of, of weapon system, knowing that there might be some issues of reliability of the system, taking the risk and therefore be accountable or responsible for that. You are on mute, Professor. Sorry, automatic transfer. I agree with you that every contracting state have to observe and uh, and implement uh, the specific rules of IHL conventions. And uh, and the uh, but the question is uh, uh, when we discuss the uh, uh, when we discuss the questions uh, and we have to divide it into two levels. I think everybody knows here so that the, the level of state's responsibility and this level of uh, individual criminal responsibility. So I just covered a question in my presentation. So uh, whether it is possible for individual cr criminal responsibility, but for states' responsibility, uh, we uh, so we know that we apply different rules. For uh, the question, uh, what I uh, the question I found is uh, it's quite difficult for us to attribute for 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 for, for the so identification for the attributability. Uh, for example, my research fellow suggested that the Article 8 of the IOC draft to article for international roughly states responsibility should be applicable. Uh, so my question is, do you really want to rely on the, the effective control test, which was applied by the International you know, Court of Justice to assess the relationship of the autonomous weapon system and the military personnel? Uh, my research trail says that yes, it could be. It could be. Uh, it is quite comparable. Uh, the weapon system, uh, uh, the AI weapon systems, are uh, uh, have some analogy with the non-state non-state actors or entities under the international humanitarian law. I think it, it could be. But the question is, if we want, uh, if we want to apply the Article Eight according to the jurisprudence of IC, ICJ. There must uh, there must be the evidence to show that there is a specific instruction, the specific instruction, or from the upper line to the bottom line. Uh, that means from the state to 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 the weapon systems. Yeah, but in in, in the situation we discussed, for example, the, when the autonomous weapon system will, was actually in fact out of control, how could we find identify there is a specific instruction? Yo, yo, uh, <laughs> almost impossible. 
performance is possible. So here, uh, I might just refer to a two uh, a notion which was mentioned by the the AI laboratory of the US Air Force. They mentioned the traceability, and it's, uh, and also the traceability, uh, the par the par the transparency of traceability. That means sir, how you could sir, trace as uh, every step of computation of the computer system to explain uh, how the AI system make a decision. So, so, but everybody knows that when we, in, in a neural network, in the, there is the black box for the algorithm. So it is almost impossible. So even the, the, the DIB, the Defense Innovation Boards of the United States has suggested the DARPA of the defense uh, of the defense departments uh, should apply uh, the scientific research on how we could test the traceability and the tra traceability transparency, the transparency to test the reliability of the of the autonomous weapons system. So that's the case. I don't think it's a question. Uh, I, I don't, basically, I don't think it's a question of uh, whether uh, the law is sufficient or not sufficient to. Uh, to tell the responsibility, but the question of uh, a combination of law, the jurisprudence of the tribunals, and also the combination of the difficult uh, tech, uh, the difficulties of the technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, yes. for your kind answer. And and we are almost uh, reaching the end of this discussion. And I would like <laughs> to thank each of our panelists. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for, for their very valuable contribution today. And as a last question, I, may I ask you all to take the floor for like 30 seconds or less answer to the following questions, because of all those discussions have been also uh, um, provided to, to the audience to try to inform also the discussion of the GG on law. So according to you all, what's the main legal challenge raised by the operationalization of the guiding principle? And what should be, of course, your solution to try to overcome this challenge? And uh, may I start uh, in the order that uh, we had here the, the, for the speaker? May I start with uh, Meta? Thank you, Pauline, and, and, and it was really great to, to listen to the second half of the seminar as well. In my 30 seconds, I wanted to identify just a few challenges. The first is what was mentioned by, um, or already mentioned by Ryan, that some of the questions of IHL interpretation um, and indeed application are not novel and rather have vexed lawyers, diplomats, uh, civil servants for years, if not decades. Um, and so um, there are real challenges involved in resolving these kinds of questions that are not going to, you know, overnight um, become clear to us. So um, identifying those ongoing or overarching issues and being able to somehow silo them is, is one challenge. Um, a linked one is being able to then identify the novel or specific questions that relate to autonomous weapon systems and to identify some kind of um, internationally agreed practice or limits relating to that. Um, I think this is a challenge, especially in view of ongoing debates about in general, how IHL is to be interpreted and applied, not to mention how it's to be done with, in relation to these newer technologies. Um, and finally, the final challenge I would mention is just um, the challenge of properly contextualizing or locating the legal issues in amongst all of the interconnected um, questions, challenges, concerns relating to autonomous weapon systems. Um, even as an international lawyer, I'm strongly of the view that we may never find all the answers we seek in international law, not even in international humanitarian law. Um, for example, uh, the question, how much certainty, how much predictability is demanded by IHL um, of the commander, of the user? We, we don't currently have the answer to that question and we may never have that answer in, a, in an agreed way. So what do we do when there are existing questions about um, how international law is to be interpreted and applied. What do we do next? And how do we move beyond a debate about um, the law towards um, a focus on um, action and, and, and practice? 
Thank you very much, Neta. I uh, do not see Dr. Chengeta uh, anymore, so I need to practice it. So I will ask uh, directly Professor Rain Livoja, please. 30 seconds or less. Thanks very much for the question. Um, I, I'd make two points, and they both sort of go outside the remit of the CCW a little bit, but I think there's still comments worth making. One is that I think that GGE has already made one very important contribution to international humanitarian law, which is to highlight the significance of Article 36 weapons reviews. I don't think that there has been any period uh, in the existence of additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions where Article 36 would have gotten this much attention. Uh, there's further work to be done there, uh, how to ensure that more states undertake these reviews, and how in practice should those views be undertaken in relation to uh, autonomous weapon systems. Second point, which came up in one of the previous webinars, is how do we uh, deal with autonomous weapon systems and the technologies that uh, uh, support them uh, within our existing export control uh, mechanisms? Thank you very much. So, um, Professor, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Professor uh, Xian Ling, please, 30 seconds or less. Okay. Okay. So, I also have two observations. And the first is the uh, difference. South African countries are well, group two, but different categories of countries are having attitudes with the IAC as well as the, the, the autonomous weapon systems. So, so that is the particular practically, I think that the, the great challenges for the big powers, and they always want to have a uh, have a wait and see policies because they are not so sure how uh, to to what extent they could develop the uh, they are their AI industries. So maybe they will just uh, not, are not so eager to further the further discussion at a research work or even to stipulate some international norms on this specific area. So my number two observations, uh, generally speaking, for for the issue of responsibility, uh, so we apply the approach of uh, of analyzing the mastery and active sphere. But this approach is not suitable, it's not adaptable for the situation to analyze the machine with the relationships. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. And last but not least, Dr. Thompson Shengeta, please. 30 seconds, uh, Thank you very much. To autonomous weapons systems such as uh, international humanitarian law is only operationalizable if it is sufficient or adequate to govern autonomous weapons systems. It is a mistake to seek to operationalize that which is inadequate or is not fit for purpose. Wheels will come off. Stretching existing law and creative interpretation of existing law may actually tear it apart. The solution is to first perhaps agree on a legal standard on human control as informed by existing law and ethics, and then codify it as part of a new legally binding instrument on autonomous weapon systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tengeta, and thank you all for your very insightful and enlightening participation. And I guess we will hear much more about those topics during the next GEON Love session. Um, I would like also to thank the audience for their very uh, active participation and inspiring questions during this webinar. And I will now turn the floor to uh, Mr. Jivan Gorczewski, the chair of the GEON Laws, and uh, for the last word on this seminar. Sir? Thank you very much. And once again, uh, really uh, three, three webinars that have uh, delivered a lot of good information and discussion on uh, uh, this important issue that we're dealing with within the GG. But I think uh, the issues are, um, are of relevance uh, in other areas as well. 
And uh, again, the GGE has throughout, and even as a meeting of experts before it was a GGE, has benefited from contributions from not just diplomats, but also experts, legal, technological, military experts who have contributed over the years and have really put in uh, a lot of valuable input over the years that uh, with which we can we can benefit. Um, just quickly, I think I would um, mention something that was mentioned in, in by one of the presenters, and it was a part of the slide as well, that uh, until 2018, um, the issue of um, challenges to IHL and whether IHL sufficed uh, was uh, uh, present and uh, disappeared. Uh, in 2019, we actually made it an agenda item. Uh, so not only has it disappeared, it, it made it as an agenda item. And this is where uh, indicative of uh, how we all have to really uh, be very uh, focused in all of our realms in how we address this, because it is quite complex and we all have to really um, have um, that focus uh, um, uh, within it. It has been mentioned here, and I think that throughout as well these three days, that there are challenges, obviously. Uh, the GGE has uh, uh, recognized this um, and tried to um, address it. The complementarity throughout has been also helped by these kinds of not just webinars by uh, organizations uh, like UNIDER and, and ODA, but also ICRC papers, events, uh, IPRA, uh, ICRAC, there have been complementary processes that have been going on that have fed into the process of, and have really made it uh, a very uh, detailed uh, discussion throughout. Uh, you've put it well, uh, Pauline, in highlighting what risk, how do we then um, uh, manage the risk if there is this, uh, these are challenges with these emerging technologies. And it's this idea, I guess, of a dance between law and power. Uh, one would say a tango, but then uh, a third partner jumps in here, and that's technology. And how do we then reconcile this dance, this tension uh, sometimes, and in tango there is tension as well, uh, to provide a proper platform for us to go ahead uh, from, from now on. Um, well, a, a panelist also recognized that it is very difficult to have a common legal standard for all means and methods in warfare, and that's exactly what we've tried to uh, approach. Uh, just now, one of the uh, last thoughts that were expressed exact is that um, there is uh, perhaps um, not even all of IHL, not even all of international law might fully be able to address. And then we come to this aspect of power that I was just mentioned in the end uh, uh, that we'll need. But the idea then is, um, and again, to bring back from tomorrow, how do we reconcile this complexity uh, that is increasing and a trust that might be decreasing? Um, and um, as, as again, one of the last thoughts that came in is, well, uh, we've highlighted one aspect in within this life cycle of the weapon system, this Article 36, which was rightly pointed out, that hadn't been in many other discussions properly uh, fleshed out as its importance. And we have within the GG uh, addressed a lot of attention, and it is making its way as an important um, element in it. So in conclusion, I think that um, it is exactly this kind of combination of approaches that we need to have in order to have the best, the optimal, but not the best, because the best may be obviously the enemy of what is required, um, uh, the optimal um, uh, environment to address these emerging technologies, which were obviously of uh, interest to militaries and therefore will not be ignored, but at the same time do pose very novel challenges and these three webinars uh, have really helped in us uh, uh, really thinking about them uh, in a way that uh, is very constructive. And I once again thank both UNIDIR and ODA for organizing them and really answering the call um, to provide objective input into the process. Thank you very much, Pauline. Thank you to all uh, presenters of the past two years and to all participants who really contributed with good ideas. Thank you very much. Bye.